as 2010 is ending and as what we call the global jihadi threat actually is expanding worldwide as Western US uh, policy strategy so far uh, to counter the threat have not been successful some would would say failed and as we are looking at potential new strategies to confront these forces in the so-called greater Middle East there are three questions one since 9-11 and even before that who in the Middle East has been within these societies where we are present or that we have witnessed confrontations in who is actually opposing these jihadi regimes and forces question number two if indeed, indeed these forces exist what has been and most importantly is the current US policy towards them do we have one and third question are we prepared mostly the administration and the new Congress for what I have coined obviously the term is a little bit reminiscent of similar or comparable phenomena that existed towards the end of the Cold War or that ended actually the Cold War what I call the coming revolutions in the Middle East in 2011 we will be looking at the region and we will be basically seeing an expansion of jihadi forces of anti-democracy um, coalitions there is no doubt about that there is a consensus on this one in Washington and even in Brussels in Europe in Iran Syria Hezbollah in Lebanon Taliban in Afghanistan and also in Pakistan and across the Sahara the North Africa the rise of Al Qaeda Shabab in Somalia but at the same time we will be looking at pro-democracy resistance movements that have been taking place a they have been happening B that are severely suppressed and C probably the key in my short presentation today and in my forthcoming book next week they are not going back they are not accepting that despite the abandonment by the West and by the United States that they should reconsider the reasons for why they are undertaking the struggle so what I'd like to do is establish a list of what I have coined attempts for democratic revolution successful or not is not the question because in the educational process we need to understand what is the essence of these movements so that we could describe them identify them and not have a similar failure in the year to come 2011 and 11 in the same way we had that failure in not understanding what these movements meant last year and the year before and the throughout the decade there are seven of them that I would like to identify one the Iranian green movement so the Iranian revolution we've witnessed in 2009 1.5 million people taking the streets of Tehran we've seen the bloodshed and we realized afterwards for over a year and a half now that this quasi revolution has been suppressed in bloodshed in and within intelligence and counter and security activities so on and so forth my point on number one is that even though if the politicians of that movement are not always the most successful united do not respond exactly to uh, the way we looked at leaders of Central and Eastern Europe during the Reagan time during the collapse of the Soviet Union such as Václav Havel or uh, Lashvalesa there is a civil society below that made of NGOs youth women which is continuing which is which is acting on behalf of that green revolution and will be there in 2011 and 12 and 14 ahead of us two the Cedars revolution in Lebanon which in 2005 showed us 1.5 million people over a population of almost 4 million people in downtown Beirut clearly with signs in English and in French and in Arabic 
opposing the Syrian regime, opposing the Iranian domination of Lebanon, and clearly opposing Hezbollah. That Cedars revolution has paid a tremendous price since 2005. Many of its leaders, including members of parliament, have been assassinated. Many neighborhoods and areas in Lebanon, in the Christian area, in the Druze area, in the Sunni area, have been attacked by terror forces, including in May of 2008 by Hezbollah. This has happened in front of our eyes. So that revolution is not gone. Hezbollah is making progress, and in the next weeks and months, we may see more dramatic events in Lebanon for many reasons, including the findings of Special Tribunal for Lebanon and the Hariri assassination. But the bottom line here is that even if though many politicians have been assassinated, many authors have been intimidated, the last of whom Prime Minister of Lebanon who visited Tehran. Civil society, as far as we know, is organizing, is acting. Three, Sudan. Southern Sudan's population of 7 million people or more are bracing themselves for a referendum next month. It's coming fast. The regime in Khartoum, a jihadi Islamist regime, is bracing itself to crush the results of this self-determination. But it's not only about the jihadi regime of, of Sudan, it's also about a coordination within the Organization of the Islamic Conference of the Arab League. Regimes are coordinating those who are usually seen as anti-American and those who are on our list of uh, foreign aid support. Regimes and governments are coordinating diplomatic action to stand by Khartoum on the issue of self-determination in the South. These are very grave, serious issues, weeks away from us. But it's not going to affect only southern Sudan. There are a number of other uprisings against the jihadi regimes in Sudan. We almost have forgotten Darfur. We don't hear much from the U.S. government, at least the administration and the past, and in Congress on Darfur. Although there is a resistance in, in Darfur, it has been abandoned. The heads of that resistance are now being forced to go to Qatar to sit down with the regime, moderated by a forces, political forces which certainly are not interested in seeing self-determination in Darfur. There are other spots in Sudan that our public is not educated about, which will and are going to surprise us in terms of their opposition to the jihadists. The Nuba Mountains in the south, the Beja tribes in the east, Sudan's forthcoming revolts may surprise a lot of us. So we'd better be prepared for 2011 and beyond. Four, Algeria. In northern Algeria, the Kabyles, the Berber population in northern Algeria, is preparing for a referendum on their own self-determination next April, May. Now we're talking about 8 million people. Al-Qaeda is assassinating and terrorizing in the Kabyle areas and the Kabyle popular demonstrations are taking place. Not so much in a manner that we can see them and we are familiar with them in our media and that's another problem. We're not reporting about that. Egypt. The 12 to 15 million Copts in Egypt, the single largest Christian population of the Middle East, is being su is submitted to harassment, persecution. Churches have been attacked, destroyed. But the cops are responding in demonstrations, civil demonstrations. Yes, they are in a quasi-state of revolt. They are addressing the international community for help. Afghanistan, number six. The only component I will talk about quickly, mention, I would say, is the fact that outside the government and its institutions, and the corruption that exists there, and outside the Taliban, there is a third player that we have failed to really identify, work with, partner with. The NGOs, the civil society, women's movement, students' movement, youth movements, artists, cab and bus drivers who are not with the Taliban, 
We have no policy for those. We have a lot of funding going towards Afghanistan, but we have no policy. We do not see them testifying here or in a European parliament. Seven, last, Iraq. Outside the fact that we know that the more we are going to be going out of Iraq, including in the last uh, you know, forces that we have in terms of training, what we see already is a return, a comeback of the Iranian Khomeinist influence and the re-rise of Al-Qaeda in the center. The segment I am urging ourselves to focus on as we are redeploying out of Iraq are those segments of civil society which for the past seven to eight years have worked with us, will work with them. The soft side of society, the NGOs, the civil society movements, teachers from Basra to Baghdad, let alone, of course, the Kurds in the north and the other minorities. But one very weak minority that has been submitted to constant attacks recently, the Christians of Iraq, the Assyro, Chaldean, and other Christians of Iraq. Now, my question I conclude here, after I have reviewed most of, not of course all, of the democracy-leaning movements, even in the majority of Arab and Muslim countries in the region, are we prepared? Is there some doctrine in Washington which is going to be managing the strategy of dealing with these forthcoming revolts against the terrorists? Will they be successful or not? That's not the question. Do we have a policy or not? That is the question. To engage with them in the same way, at least in a comparable manner, towards the end of the Cold War, we had at least a principle of identifying the workers struggling in Poland or dissidents across Europe. We had a policy on South Africa, on other places around the world. We don't have this policy here. So, I leave you with these thoughts, and I hope that the next Congress of next January will be more dynamic, and I'm sure it will be, and they'll be the one to initiate this policy in Washington. And I am sure that on the other side of the Atlantic, since I have been coordinating some activities between members of the U.S. Congress here in the last Congress and members of the European Parliament, there is a great interest. What needs to be is an initiative. And I do hope that the next Congress will be the one to take that initiative towards helping these people, our real long-term allies in the region. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.